On this episode, we're going to talk about having your cable certifier calibrated. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, estimators, project managers, ICT personnel, and even customers. We are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button or the bell button to be notified when new content is being created? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms, would you mind giving us a five-star rating? And if this show is not a five-star rated show, email me and let me know what I can do to make it a five-star rated show. Those couple little steps helps us take on the algorithm which helps us get this message out to more people so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the ICT industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? You know I do a live stream Thursday night, 6 p.m. Make sure that you visit us because we answer your favorite questions by your favorite RCDD. And then finally, while this show is free and will always remain free, If you would like to support the show, would you click on the QR code right there? You can buy me a cup of coffee. You can schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me after hours, of course, and help support the show. As I said in the beginning, those testers are pretty expensive little testers. But you don't just buy them and then just don't have to ever worry about them again. There are some things that you're going to have to do to make sure that that tester is functioning correctly, testing correctly, So that way you can get the warranty from the manufacturers and you can meet the customer's requirements in their RFQ or RFP. One of the things that you need to get done is calibration. There's a lot of confusion about testing tester calibration. I've gotten several questions over the last few weeks and I've been compiling them, just waiting for the opportunity to bring on a subject matter expert. Hmm, do I know any? Hmm, I might know one, hold on. Steve Gals from AEM. I consider him a subject matter expert. Steve, how you doing, my friend? All right, Chuck. Good to see you again. Absolutely. It's been a while since you've been on the show. It has. Um, yes. So you heard the intro. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. I was um, teaching. a. I got the I afforded the opportunity to teach a class for some gray bar people, uh, inside and outside salespeople, who, t- just to kind of get them up to speed on structured cabling. And one of the tips that I told them was, you know, if you sell a certifier to a contractor in your Outlook or whatever email program you're using, just set yourself a reminder in 11 months to send that that contractor a reminder to calibrate their tester because trust me, they're going to forget. But that's only one of the many, one of the many problems out there. So before we get into these whole, all these tester questions, since you haven't been on the show in a few months, why don't you go ahead and give us the uh, the quick introduction? Who is Steve Cowles? So uh, I'm I'm Steve Cowles, the product manager and tech services manager with AEM Precision Cable Test. Um, I'm I'm an old guy like Chuck, been around the industry for uh, it's getting close to forty years now, Chuck. Catching um, up with me. It's weird. Uh, but yeah, I, I've been uh, in the test and measurement industry since '99, and um, you know, heavily involved in certification and copper and fiber and DSL and outside plant stuff, and uh, run the full gamut of that. Been on board with AEM for the last uh, four years. It was just four years last month, and um, you know, we've got a multifunction cable certifier. So it does more than just certify the cable. You, it, if you've ever tuned in. I've got a tech talk, um, uh, video cast that I do, uh, every couple of weeks. And we talk about the products and applications and, you know, different things. So, um, that's me. Very cool. Uh, I didn't realize you've been for, with AM for four years now. Yeah. May, May was four years. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's gone by fast. That's one of the drawbacks of getting our age. Time yeah. starts going a lot faster. It does. It does. So let's start off with the first question. Why is it important to have your cable certifier calibrated regularly? 
So there's a few reasons that it's important. Um, number one, any kind of delicate instrument can, um, can I don't want to say deteriorate because it's not really the right word, but it, it can lose a little accuracy over time, especially with heavy use. Um, back in, I call it the olden days, back in the 1990s, when we were doing cable certification, those testers use mechanical relays. And you might remember the testers going click, 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 click. So mechanical relays, certainly there was much more chance for something to, to get out of whack on those. Everything now is solid state. So there's not a mechanical issue, but it, it's, you know, over time, depending on what the instrument's been exposed to, um, you know, the condition of your adapters and everything else, it's good to get it calibrated just because it, you want to make sure it's performing at its utmost because you're measuring to tolerances specified by the standards. And if your accuracy drifts a little bit because it's out of calibration, then your measurement may not be all that accurate. You may be masking bad measurements or you might start failing measurements on cables that are really good. So, um, or when you get into those marginal areas, you may have heard of a star pass or a star fail where the, the pass has a little asterisk next to it. That asterisk is there because that, that measurement was it, compared to the pass fail threshold was within the tolerance, the accuracy level of your tester. And that's, you know, prescribed by the standards. And if your accuracy is not really that tight anymore, then you may get a pass when it really should be a star pass. And in my opinion, star pass, I think you've said this too, Chuck, mm -hmm. if you have a star pass, treat it as a fail. You need to troubleshoot it uh, because it's all about headroom. And yeah. then the other part of that to calibrate, why calibrate the manufacturers that give you an extended warranty for the cabling systems, they are not going to accept your test results if you haven't had your tester calibrated. So it's, it's important to make sure that you get it calibrated at, at the recommended interval, which, which is, is a one year interval. Um, you know, that's, it's largely driven by manufacturer and specifiers that, that one year. Um, and, and one year is a good time frame because you don't know how much you've used a tester or not used it in a year. So doing it in, in one year is good because when you do a calibration, you're not just calibrating the instrument. We'll talk a little bit more in detail um, as we go here about what that calibration entails, but, but you're doing other things. You're checking the adapters, making sure they're performing properly, uh, making sure the unit's in good condition, et cetera. You, you know, you actually already answered my next question is how often should a tester be, a, a certification test that be calibrated? You said a year. Yep. Is that driven by the standards or is that driven by the test manufacturers? It's really driven by the manufacturers and the, and the specifiers. And, um, you know, you'll see a lot of that in, in the scope of work. When you get an RFQ, you'll see that in there. It's, you know, or an RFP, uh, that it's needs to have been calibrated within one year. And if you're doing a system warranty, the manufacturers are requiring it anyway, they're going to tell you that it should be calibrated within a year. And, and, you know, that's kind of where the, the tester manufacturers, the cable system manufacturers all kind of work together. Um, and, and there's so much experience in, in the testing industry over the years between us and other tester manufacturers and the cable and connectivity manufacturers that kind of boiled everything down and, and, and looking at what happened with testers over time. That's where we ended up settling on this one year interval. And pretty much everybody's going to tell you it's a <clears throat> it's a one year interval. Just out of curiosity, and you and you may not know uh, the answer to this. Why is it not tied to the number of tests? Because in a year, you might have a small contractor who might you might test two thousand cables. You might have a large contractor who might test twenty thousand cables. So um, the number of tests. Ha certainly has an impact on it. The number of tests will really have more of an impact on the condition of the test adapters. You know, the, the connector on your permanent link, the jack on a channel adapter, for instance, um, <clears throat> the number of tests performed with those, there's mating cycles involved there. So, so that impacts a lot. When you're doing testing for a large job, you're leaving your permanent link adapters in. The biggest connector 
that is critical is the connector where that test adapter mates with the, your test platform. Um, that has to be a very high precision connector and, and it's rated to a very high number of mating cycles because you're not plugging and unplugging that every time you're testing. The other thing is the, the electronics in there. If you're sitting here and you're running tests, you know, for a full day, you know, a thousand tests or whatever you, you run, um, that isn't going to have as much of an impact on the electronics and, and, you know, what's going on as time may have where you start to get some drift. So it's, um, you know, it, it's better to have it as a time-based and yeah, there was some calculation in there, uh, when the one year interval was, was figured out that involved average testing, um, average numbers of tests. Um, and you, you really can't, you, know, you, you can't just say, okay, let's do it every thousand tests or whatever, because one tester that ran a thousand tests may not be the same as another tester that ran a thousand tests. Yeah. You mentioned that old test or the old Penta scanner test. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I was, cause I used to do a lot of work in government agencies, some that are really careful about the stuff that you bring in their buildings. And I, I used to be kind of self-conscious about using that tester because it sounded like a ticking time bomb, <laughs> you know, you didn't want somebody, you know, calling the security on you because they thought you had a, you know, something that was going to explode. Because it would, it, it did. It would tick, 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 almost like the uh, the AOL modems when you used to dial in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> now yeah. we're talking real old school. Yeah, there. we're showing our age. You, the fact right. that you knew what I was talking about and you thought it was funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're old, Steve. We're old. Yeah. Um, so you already mentioned one of the potential consequences of not calibrating uh, affecting the manufacturer warranty because a lot of the manufacturers do require that warranty and they will also check it as well because it shows up in the test results when the last time it was calibrated That's right um what are some other consequences that might come about from somebody who hasn't had their tester calibrated so um not having your tester calibrated within the interval um it, it can affect all of your measurements and and you know, we can we can talk through the different things that are uh, are done during a calibration. All these different parameters that are um, that are undertaken when you uh, use the calibration artifacts and do the actual calibration, but they impact all of the measurements on the tester at various frequencies and um, your return loss, your crosstalk, your DC resistance. All these things can be impacted <clears throat> if your tester. Uh, is not calibrated regularly. So you may have a tester that you didn't calibrate it a year and maybe at a year and a half, it's still working fine. Uh, but you don't know. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, you know, you could have it two years and it works fine. But, but again, you don't know. It might look to you like it's working fine, but because the accuracy isn't really where it's supposed to be, all your measurements that look good, they might be good, but they might not be as good as you think. So that, you know, the, the biggest part of this is the, the accuracy of the tester. You want to make sure that all of these different test parameters that you measure, I mean, there's, there's a multitude of measurements that we do. There's literally thousands of measurements because you're, you're doing, you know, when you look at things like return loss and crosstalk uh, and, and um, resistance and, and all these things, all the RF measurements are done through the frequency range. So if you're doing cat 6a, you're, you're doing, you know, everything all the way up to 500 megahertz. You get into cat eight, you're going to two gigahertz. Um, if you're in Europe doing cat seven, um, you know, class FA ISO, you're at a thousand megahertz. So when you're doing these tests, there's, there's a test at every, you know, every stop along that frequency range. And you're doing so many tests that if you're not accurate, you're going to start to see some problems. You know, I'm, I'm in several Facebook groups, you know, to keep current with the, the techs out in the field. And, you know, it's like low voltage nation, technology worldwide, telecom technicians and all that stuff. And I see a lot of guys on there who are starting their own businesses and buying, you know, cable certifiers. And and what's your recommendation if someone buys a cable certifier? And, and they well, the certifier will tell them when it was last calibrated, but if they buy a certifier, a used one, not, not a new one. Should they just go ahead and get it calibrated again? So if it's, if it's within its calibration period, 
you know, if it's been less than a year since it was last calibrated, you're probably fine to use it. Um, but you don't know what that person who sold it to you has been doing with it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it may work fine, but you, you may want to at least have it checked out, um, by the manufacturer. And, and you can, you know, I would say contact the manufacturer, the tester, ask for their input on that. Um, see what they think. They might have you run a couple tests on it to check a couple things out, um, to make sure things look good. And they might tell you, yeah, you can wait until the next calibration interval, or they might have you run a couple tests and go, yeah, we might need to replace your permanent link adapters or your channel adapters aren't really looking good. Th those might need to get replaced. That's usually what can happen if you're buying a used tester. It, if it's within the calibration period, the calibration might be all right, but you may have to replace the test adapters. Yeah, the test adapters have a life cycle to them. And, and I think I read in the TDMM, maybe it was 5,000 insertions, I think. I read, or maybe it was a standard. I don't remember. I read one of the, it was 5,000 insertions. Yeah. What What are some of the things that a technician should look at at those test heads? You know, each, let's say they pull a bag, one out of the bag because they're going to start a testing job. And most companies share testers. They don't issue everybody a brand new tester. Right. Because they're expensive. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, so, so we tend to share testers. So when you're breaking up a tester that another crew had or another, it was back in the warehouse. What are some of the things they should look at when they're looking at, since you mentioned those, the test heads, what are some of the things they should look at to verify that those has, test heads are, are still usable? So the, the things to look at, look at the, the connector. Um, yeah, I've got a, an adapter here on the back of the adapter. There's an interface connector here. Uh, that's what plugs into the tester. So look at that main connector, make sure it looks good. Doesn't have any, um, any noticeable damage or corrosion or anything, um, that's going to be key. Permanent link adapters obviously going to have a, a two meter test cord on them. That's going to be the most common one you're using with copper testing is that permanent link. So it's got a, a permanently affixed uh, two meter test cord that comes out of that test adapter. Look at the area where the cord comes out of the test adapter to make sure the strain relief's intact. You don't see that the cable's damaged. Feel and look all along that two meter cable to make sure it doesn't seem like it's been kinked at any point. Uh, and then especially at the, the RJ45 plug end, examine that strain relief where, where the connector and the cord meet. Make sure that is in good condition. You don't see any damage to the jacket of the cable. Look at the, the tip of the connector. Look at those contacts. Those eight contacts, they should be nice and bright and shiny. If they're dull, um, then they, they probably have oxidized a little bit. They might still work okay when, when they get a little dull. Um, but also look for any kind of damage, you know, make sure there's, you know, not some kind of obvious damage. Same thing with the channel adapter. One of the most common things that happens with a channel adapter, and remember the channel, we're actually, if we're using channel adapters, we're supposed to be testing the patch cords and equipment cords that are being left behind in the system, right? A lot of people use channels and just, they have the same patch cord going from, from jack to jack. But what can happen in the field is if somebody makes their own patch cord, which we tell everybody, don't do that and it's not a good termination and you plug it into a channel adapter, it can push the pins up. Um, or somebody accidentally plugs an RJ11 into that RJ45 port. It can damage, it happens, it damages mm -hmm. the pins. So look at those pins to make sure that they look good, they don't look damaged. Now you may see in some cases pins that they're not all gonna be the exact same level and that's by design. Um, the manufacturers design them that way and you work for a, a connector manufacturer, so you know this Chuck, yep. you know, where it's to help avoid crosstalk. So you're not all going to be in the same design, but they're, they're, they have specific tolerances and they give a little bit when you plug that plug into that jack. So if you see any damage on those pins, that's a sure sign. Or if the connector's loose, you know, I've seen that happen where I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're taking a hammer and a chisel and trying to you know drive the connector in, but I've seen those. They get treated before. rough. They, they do. get treated rough. They do. And, and here's the thing. Here, here's a tip for somebody who might be working in a area of the country that not Florida, don't leave your tester. In, well, it actually this applies even for Florida. Don't leave your tester in the back of the truck when it doesn't need to be in the back of the truck. Yep. Right. Yeah. You know, in Florida, you know, I know my, my pickup truck, if it sits out, you know, I usually park it in the shade 
but if that, the, the the primo parking space in Florida is the shaded spot, not the closest spot to the to That's the right. building you're getting to, because right. it can get extremely hot inside that vehicle. Mm-hmm. And in the north, you know, if wintertime, it gets cold. Yeah. And I'm assuming those elements probably affect the performance of a tester. Do they not? They do. They do. And all of your testers, if you look in the specifications, they'll have a max, they'll have an operating temperature and a storage temperature range. So you don't want to go outside those, those upper and lower boundaries. Um, you know, and if you, if you do store it in, in an environment that exceeds those limits, then you probably need to, to make sure you're going to leave extra time to allow that tester to cool down or warm up or whatever. Um, but especially heat, you can really cause some damage to equipment if, if you leave it for an extended period in, in really high heat. And see, that's always been my concern because I, I understand somebody starting a new business wanting to buy the used tester like we talked about a few minutes ago. I certainly understand it because they may not have enough money to go drop, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for a cable certifier. I get that. Mm-hmm. I get that, but I'm always leery. It's just a personal opinion. I'm always leery about buying used electronics. You know, electronics are one of those things I want to buy brand new. Yeah, if I'm buying like a, if I'm buying like a shovel or something for the farm, I, I don't care if it's old and used. But something electronic, why are they selling it? Yeah. What, what kind of conditions was it left in their truck in the summertime? And, and then, you know, now it's kind of warped a little bit. And sometimes it's act because yeah. somebody selling that, that test for, you know, use tests are not, may not tell you that information. Yeah. And you, and you just don't know. And, and I always tell people, you know, when you think about whether or not you're going to leave that tester in your car in extreme cold or extreme heat, treat it like you would a laptop. You're going to leave your laptop yeah. in there when it's, you know, 102 degrees in the shade here in central Florida which means it's 140 or 150 in your car. Um, you know, would you leave your laptop sit there for hours on end? Your cell yeah. phone. Yeah. I know sometimes I leave my cell phone on the tractor on Saturdays when I'm out there working and, and direct sun. And after a while it will say I'm overheated. You got to, I got to cool down, mm-hmm. you know? So, so you mentioned the parameters when doing the, uh, the calibration, what are some of the performance metrics that are looked at during a calibration cycle? So let me, um, I'm going to share my screen here. All righty. Uh, and oh, let, let me turn it on. There we go. All right. So, of course, you, here you see a, a test report, right? Yep. So, and you mentioned earlier, your calibration date shows up. It's right there on your test report. Uh, so that's going to be front and foremost. Now, when you get a calibration done, you'll see a calibration certificate. Um, and I'll scroll down through this and just show you some of these parameters. So there's a few different um, things that are, are looked at. And, and we use these calibration artifacts and they'll, they'll actually test the unit uh, and then make subtle corrections and adjustments to fine tune the unit. And then they do a verification to make sure everything is functioning properties, properly. So directivity. So this, this really, you know, when you're transmitting a signal uh, into a, a terminator, you know, into, into one of these uh, terminator, essentially one of these artifacts, the terminator should absorb all the signal. So you shouldn't really see any reflected signal, no return loss. You, know, you shouldn't see any signal coming back. If you do, that means that you've got some leakage um, uh, in your, your uh, transmission there. So, um, so directivity is measured. Source match. Um, you know, ideally, the, the tester is going to match the impedance of the system. And what should happen is when you're testing with a main and a remote, as we do in certification, the remote unit should absorb that, that energy from that signal, should absorb that signal at that far end. None of that should get reflected back from the tester um, because if it does, then it's going to mask your real return loss measurements. So if you're actually getting return loss as an effect of your remote on your tester, you, it's going to skew your return loss measurements. So, so that's why we do the source match. The tracking. Uh, so with tracking, there's two extremes. Um, we're, we're looking at in the cable here, an open, which is going to be um, infinite resistance and a short, which should be close to zero at the tester. Um, so these, when they're, they're compared together, should balance out uh, right around zero. Then you've got your source uh, a return loss, your source load return loss here. So what this is, when you do get a signal coming back, uh, a reflected signal, 
and, and part of the calibration artifacts will intentionally reflect a signal back. And when it comes back, it should be absorbed uh, into that source tester. Uh, and again, this, this goes back into the whole return loss thing. So when you're measuring return loss on a cable, there's a reflection and you get signal coming back. If you're your source, your tester on the main end, or if it's the, the signal coming from the remote as a transmit, if it doesn't absorb that reflected signal, it will bounce it back out onto the cable. And now you're actually injecting a reflected signal back into the cable, and it's going to cause problems with your crosstalk and your return loss measurements. So that's why we, we do um, that part of the calibration. Uh, the output signal balance and the, the, the common mode rejection are going to be the next two down here. So uh, these are kind of related, and they're both related to our TCL measurements, which is our measurement of the cable uh, um, and how resistant it is to noise interference. So the output signal balance, you know, we're looking at, think about the pair. you got a positive and a negative signal going out. They need to be perfectly balanced. So they're in phase, the same intensity, that you know, the same... Um, uh, same magnitude on the plus and the minus, so they balance out to zero. So your your transmitter needs to be able to, to send that perfectly balanced signal. The other part of this, the common mode rejection, has to do with that balanced signal coming back to you. Um, going into a cable, there are going to be things that, that will change the signals that's coming back, and you need to be able to measure those. So if your tester can't be within a certain tolerance of being close to zero on the measured signal, you're going to have problems seeing those issues on the cable. So these two are really tied in together. And that's that same plus and minus balanced signal on both sides of the pair. The last two you see here, and these are on all of your calibration certificates when you, when you get these back from having the tester calibrated. Um, the residual next. So this is, this is a measurement of, the, the easiest way to explain it is internal leakage or internal crosstalk on your test equipment. All pieces of equipment are going to have this but you need to be within a certain tolerance. And, and you'll see limit lines, all these red limit lines you see on here, just like you would on a regular cable test, you have a limit line. So you need to make sure that you uh, don't exceed the threshold there. And then the last one is a really important one, random noise floor. So this is essentially the smallest measurable noise level of the equipment when you're not transmitting a signal into that cable. So it, it's, you know, it's really goes to the sensitivity and tying into how, how much, how, how you can see the subtle issues with a cable when you're doing a, a certification test. The other things that don't show up in these graphs are our DC um, uh, part of this. So that's the DC resistance measurement. So um, that is also tested as part of the calibration to make sure that we're falling within. Don't, don't close that just yet. I, I just want to point, I'm gonna point something out real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at this, it looks very similar to like a regular cable test result. So I'm assuming they can apply the same kind of things, right? So as long as the, 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 the squiggly lines above it don't touch or go below the, the baseline, win a winner, chicken dinner, right? Exactly. And headroom, same thing, headroom. You know, the, the, you know, the more space you have between the, the plot here and that limit line, the more headroom you've got, which is, which is good. And if it goes below this, limit line you know it on, on the test it's actually above the limit line but on the people seem to have an easier way of uh, or easier understanding when you put the limit line low like this on the printed report um if it were to exceed that limit line it would fail the calibration it wouldn't pass so you know uh, dc resistance is going to fail it uh and then any of these parameters will fail it a, a, as well and you know, if a, if a calibration fails, then you have to go back uh, to square one and figure out why it failed um, and determine if it's an issue with the tester. Was it something you were doing during the calibration? Maybe you need to recalibrate. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a whole series. A, a calibration like this um, typically takes about 90 minutes to two hours, oh, wow. depending. Wow. So, yeah. And this it, is not something an end user can do, right? This is something that has to be done by, no, no. by a manufacturer. This has to be done by the manufacturer or an authorized calibration center that's been trained by the manufacturer on the proper way to do it. Um, because there's a, a whole process here and it's not just doing these things with the calibration artifacts. There's a whole, you, you have to do a set reference between the units, um, other parts of the calibration service, including updating the firmware, physically inspecting everything, make sure nothing looks like it's damaged. 
And then after the calibration, we do something um, with the permanent link and channel adapters called a CAT 6A verification baseline test, where it's it's like plugging the units into each other with a permanent link in one and a channel in the other and running a, a certification test, but it's to a much tighter standard than what you do for installed cabling. And it's designed to look at those test adapters to make sure that they're functioning properly. Have you ever calibrated a, a tester that failed calibration? And then when you went in and, and did your, your normal troubleshooting steps, it just, you couldn't get it to not pass calibration? Yes. And um, in that instance, it ended up being something uh, with the, that main connector. You know, I think I showed you earlier that the connector on the back of that test adapter where it mates with the tester. So in that instance, what was going on was there was a problem with the main connector where it was um, mated with the board. Um, there was one of the contacts had, had actually been damaged. And in that case, it was an instant where somebody had actually dropped it off a 20 foot scissor lift. And <laughs> they're yeah. not rated for that. No, no, they're not <laughs> rated. You, you can drop them. They're pretty rugged, but uh, it, it was off a 20 foot scissor lift. And um, when they sent it in, they didn't tell us anything about that. And we were trying to calibrate this and just nothing seemed to be right. So what happens is, is if you have a test adapter in there and you drop it from a, from that high of a height, depending on where it lands, you know, what part of the tester hits the ground, different things can happen. And in this case, it, it must've hit directly on the adapter and, and, you know, transferred that energy through the connector to the board uh, and caused a problem. But it was interesting because there's other things on the board that were actually shifted uh, the, the, yeah, the impact was so heavy. We saw components that had shifted out of place. Um, so it, it takes a pretty significant amount of force to do that. Um, and that also brings up a, a, another good point too, is we, I, I was, when I was talking about the heat and the cold, right? You got your printed circuit boards in there. Those expand and contract when they get ex exposed to heat and cold and enough cycles like that, you could cause problems on there as well. Right. Yep. So let me ask you this. Um, so you said it's usually done by the manufacturer or a calibrated uh, house. Is there any cost associated from a from a from a test owner's perspective to get their tester calibrated? Yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, and every manufacturer is going to be a little different. Um, but yeah, there's a cost for calibration. Now, uh, most manufacturers like us and our competitors offer a a a coverage program, we'll call it. We have something called extended care and you can get it for either a one year or a three year version. Um, and what it does is it, it, it includes the calibration, but it also protects you against damage. So if you do drop that tester off a of 20 I was going to ask, is, lift, is it covered being dropped from 20 feet from a does, And that customer had our extended care program and they got their repair free of charge. Nice. So, um, uh, and in that case, I think we actually just replaced the entire board, which is like getting a, a whole new tester. Um, so yeah. So, um, you know, consult with your manufacturer of your test equipment. We offer that and, and, you know, our program, it covers those kind of damages. It covers the calibration cost. And realistically, I, I don't know if the others are doing it this way, but the way ours is, it works out to be about the same cost as calibrating annually. Um, and if you do the three year, you get a little extra discount. So you come out ahead of the game, but you get the additional protection. Um, and that also gives you um, a free replacement once a year of your permanent link and channel adapters as part of that. So, um, you know, if the channel adapters and permanent link adapters aren't performing, they need to be replaced. You don't have to buy new ones. Once a year, you can replace them. So um, I recommend whether you're using our tester uh, or one of our competitors um, to, to check into that, that coverage program to see if, um, if you can get on board. And typically, manufacturers are going to offer that when you buy the product. Mm -hmm. They might give you a window. We give 90 days typically. So um, if you buy it now and you decide within 90 days, yeah, I really do want to do that extended care. I'll, I'll go ahead and buy that and add oh, okay. it to do that. So Very cool. Now, I know AEM sits on several of the standards committees. Mm -hmm. Is What are the... Do the standards spec out that they have to be calibrated every year or do they give you any kind of guidance? Well, the standards talk about calibration. They talk about the, the accuracy levels and the calibration kind of goes back to the accuracy level. So you've heard of uh, the, the level three E testers. 
right. and level two G testers. So three E is what encompasses your five E six and six A. So level three E tester, you can test up to cat six A level two G, which is what we are, can go all the way up through cat eight dot two. So, um, and that's where the calibration comes in. If you're not calibrated and it gets out of calibration, then your accuracy comes into question. And that that's why it ties in. And the TIA, the ANSI TIA 1152A um, talks about um, all of that. So, um, you know, if you're, you're looking for a standard and you read up on the field testing um, specifications and, you know, what parameters need to be tested, you know, what has to be done for calibration, you can look at that standard. So if somebody's running a tester out in the field, Mm -hmm. what are some signs that they can watch out for that's going to tell them it's about time to get that tester calibrated? So a few things. So um, when you start seeing test failures on something that you you're pretty sure should be passing and, you know, if you've done the work, you know, you know, maybe. You know, something got a little hosed up. It was a Monday morning and you didn't need to prepare <laughs> a twist or whatever. Or a Friday uh, afternoon. Or Friday afternoon. You're in a hurry to get to the bar. You know, it's. Uh-huh. Um, but if, if you start to see some strange things happening, um, the, the first thing to do, one, one thing that you can see in the field, you might no- start to notice a resistance measurement um, where your resistance values seem a little high. Plug your main unit into your remote. Use a permanent link and a channel adapter. Plug them into each other. Run an auto test. See what your resistance is when they're plugged into each other. If it's anything more than a 0.5 ohm for your loop resistance, do a a set reference. I think other manufacturers might call it a field calibration process. Uh, And we call it a set reference where you, you you go into your tools and you tell it to do a set reference while they're connected together. Once it does that, it takes about a minute and a half or two minutes tops then run another auto test. It should drop that down to something below 0.5 ohms. Usually it'll be like 0.1 or 0.0. But you may get a little resistance on those over time. If you've used those adapters a lot, what Mm -hmm. happens is all that mating, that plug in and disconnect is going to wear on the contacts and that's going to increase the resistance. Um, So that's where you start to see things change. So if you zero, you you, you do that set reference, it, 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 negates that additional resistance. It, it kind of makes sure the two testers are communicating in the proper sequence and pro- proper timing. And then you start running tests and you're still seeing problems. Um, you know, you, you're seeing crosstalk problems. You're seeing return loss problems and you can't figure out why. That's when it might be time to, to, to look at getting calibration. Um, it, it should go, typically it should go more than a year, um, before you start to notice something. But if you do start to notice something that can't be explained by a problem with the adapter and replacing the adapter doesn't solve the problem, then it might be time for calibration. Now, most testers will also notify you. I was going to ask, does the tester give you some kind of notification? Yep, it does. 30 days out, we have a pop-up message that says, Hey, you're, it's getting close to time for calibration. Uh, and then if you let it go until that, that one year anniversary, it'll pop up another message and tell you uh, the, the issue with that, Chuck, is that the people that usually see the message are the tech out in the field and they just X out of it. And they're they're just cranking out to get the job done. Now it gets back to the shop and, and it's that Friday afternoon and like, oh, I'll remember to tell the boss on Monday morning and they don't tell the boss on Monday morning. Just um, because we work in communications doesn't mean we communicate with each other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's, you know, it's important to monitor that. And like you said, you said put a reminder on yeah. your calendar. Now, now something that, that um, we recently uh, implemented is we're going through our, our customer database when they, when people register their product, we do calibrations We're we're working on adding a reminder into our system that will trigger a message to go out and say, hey, it's been 11 months since you calibrated. It might be time. Now, that's that's something that's not active yet, but it's something that we're looking at adding as a feature to our customers to say, hey, you know, it's been 11 months. You might want to think about scheduling to get your unit yeah. in here to have it calibrated. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of reminders. That's why I told that gray bar group, you know, look, just put in your calendar in 11 months to reach out to that contract and say, hey, that test you bought, coming up on its renewal so you might want to get it calibrated yep because you know and you can do the same thing as a project manager or if you're the person who runs the warehouse and communication company same thing you can go into your outlook or whatever you know google calendar or whatever program you use 
and you can put in there, hey, you know, you went 11 months from today. Yep. Your mommy, test or serial number, blah, blah, blah. Let me ask you, if, how, if, when a contractor sends a tester to be calibrated, is that a, is that a, a one day turnaround, a five day turnaround? Um, days? It, it depends on workload. Typically, we quote people two to three week um, turnaround for calibration. And uh, it'll depend on, you know, how many we have in. We've turned them around quicker than that. Um, you know, we've had them come in and get turned around in a couple of days. But typically, we, we let everybody know it's going to be about two to three weeks. And I do still have your tester here, and I'm going to calibrate it. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's why it's going to, I was going to tie into that. Yeah. Like, uh, maybe yeah. I should be getting mine pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. I'll be working on that next week. So. Nice, nice, nice. Very cool. So AM has some exciting news. Right, yeah, we do. We do have some exciting news sitting in my background. What is this thing that that I get to play with? So, what you got right there is an OTDR. So, um, we launched this last month, and I've got one of the adapters right here. This is a single mode OTDR adapter, and it plugs in to the Test Pro. You just it's hot swapple. You remove the the copper adapter, and you plug in the OTDR adapter, and it will work. Um, not only with the test pro, but it will work with your network service assistant. The network service assistant is the only qualifier anywhere on the planet that you can plug an OTDR adapter into. So we, we've created our OTDR in this small form factor. It's just one of our test adapters. We've got it available individually. So everybody that already owns a test pro or an NSA can add the OTDR capability. We've got multi-mode and a single mode version. Um, they can order if they just want to order an OTDR, like what you've got there on your desk. We have kits that have a single handset, it's a single mm -hmm. test pro handset with a multi-mode or with a single mode, or you can get it with both adapters. And the nice thing about that is at some point, if you want to turn that into an optical loss test system, it just means buying another handset and the additional fiber adapters. If you want to turn it into copper certification, you just buy that second handset, get your permanent link and channel adapters, get a copper test license. Boom. Now you've turned it into that. So it's just part of our whole scalable system where everything kind of works together. Um, and, and, you know, and again, this this will work with both the test pro and the uh, the network service assistant. So, yeah, I'm going to be putting this one through its paces because I, I, I don't know if you heard this. I got a new studio. That's right. Yes, it's 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 175 feet that way. It's already it's placed, and I'm gonna start building it out here very soon. Soon, I gotta run some fiber up there to make connection between the the new podcast studio and the home to extend the network up there. So I'm gonna have to obviously test that fiber. That's right. No. It's like I need to make a trip over your way. Yes, yes. I'm gonna it's, I'm gonna line it with three quarter inch AC grade plywood. I'm gonna have ladder racks and blocks and. I'm going to do lots of hands-on videos and stuff. So I'm, I'm super excited for it. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you coming on today, Mr. Steve, especially on such short notice, but we've been talking about doing this show for, Oh, I don't know, <laughs> three months. Yeah. Something like that. We were going to try to do it when we were in North Carolina. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. When we went to uh tech fast. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Right. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but we, you know, you're a busy person. I'm a busy person. Just, you know, it didn't happen. I find like, you know what? I just need to get this show done. Well, I'm glad you reached out. It's always good to chat with you. Same here. And and it's always easy doing shows with you because you, you, you answered like three of my questions before I even asked them. <laughs> <laughs> you read my mind. That's great. You read my mind. That's great. Oh, thanks for coming on the show, my friend. All right, Chuck. Good seeing you. Take care now. Right. So calibration is important. You don't want to ignore that message when it pops up in your tester. Yes, it costs a little bit of money, but how much is it going to cost you to roll a truck back out there with a tester that has been calibrated. You gotta think about those things. Till next time, knowledge is power. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.